Okay, well, let's let's move on and let's uh, talk to an area that I know you're always uh, interested in, and um, that's pulmonary issues in the ICU. So we talked about treatment duration of VAP already, but uh, how do you diagnose VAP at the University of Michigan? Yeah, I am a huge fan of using uh, quantitative BAL cultures for diagnosis of VAP, um, have always been. But I will be very fundamentally honest and say that there are no large randomized trials that confirm that that is a better way to diagnose VAP than just an endotracheal tube culture. Again, more likely a quantitative culture than a non-quantitative culture. But because, you know, we have such a difficult time providing a clinical diagnosis for VAP is why many of us are fond of using a, um, you know, quantitative BAL. So, in general, what we do at the University of Michigan is um, for a patient who has a right lung infiltrate, um, we have taught our respiratory therapist to do a non-bronchoscopic quantitative BAL. And that's very simple and easy to do right through the endotracheal tube. On the other hand, if it's um, a left-sided pneumonia, left upper lobe, left lower lobe, then we uh, do a formal bronchoscopy and a bronchoscopic quantitative BAL to get a sample from that side. Do you use a protected brush or suction catheter when you are doing that? Yeah, so um, when we're doing the non-bronchoscopic, we do, we have a sleeve over um, the um, non-bronchoscopic BAL, a mini BAL. Uh, when we're doing bronchoscopy, the way we teach the fellows and residents to do it is they just don't suction until they wedge the scope down in the whichever lobe they're trying to get to, upper lobe or lower lobe. And then we do sterile saline and aspirate back. So we don't do a protected catheter if we're doing it bronchoscopically. And then we utilize uh, greater than 10,000 uh, CFUs as our colony count that is positive. I would just uh, tell our audience that uh, the discussion of how you diagnose VAP among the various CSAP committees was uh, as robust and as honest as you just mentioned. (laughs) Yeah, I would make one other statement is that uh, when we switched over to ventilator-associated events and probable or possible VAP, um, sort of as a um, population-based definition, it became very problematic of figuring out who really has VAP in the ICU. So I think we've really taken a step backward. The VAEs mostly are hypoxemia related to non-infectious issues. Yeah, I didn't even want to talk to you about that. So that's that's so confusing and, and muddies the water too much, I think. Agreed, agreed. So... So do you have any tricks or interventions that uh, you feel reduces your incidence of VAP in your ICU patients? Yes, so we have a a VAP prevention protocol for all of our intubated patients that um, includes, um, you know, a bundle of things that we think are possibly reducing VAP, and that is um, the very simple things of keeping the head of the bed elevated providing proper oral care. We do still use chlorhexidine twice daily. Um, We use the taper guard continuous aspiration for subglottic secretion tubes. Now, chlorhexidine um, had a lot of evidence to support its use and systematic reviews have still identified that there is a signal for reduction in VAP Uh, with chlorhexidine, but there have been a number of reports, I would say, sort of editorials um, in the last uh, couple of months stating that there is significant concern that chlorhexidine doesn't really reduce VAP except in cardiac surgical patients and that we should not use chlorhexidine for the rest of our ICU patients. And we've just reviewed this carefully um, in a number of forums here at the University of Michigan. 
And there's going to be a very large trial started by the Australia New Zealand Critical Care Trials Group to actually um, get to the bottom of this issue. But we've been asked the question of should we stop chlorhexidine? And I just think that there is not enough evidence to really push us to stop it. And we haven't seen any adverse events. And randomized trials of toothbrushing haven't had any benefit. So we're a little hesitant to stop chlorhexidine, but I think it's an important topic to be on the watch for. Actually, chlorhexidine is coming under fire from a lot of different angles, including whether or not it's as good a surgical prep as the CDC would suggest. Uh, so I, I think you're right. I think uh, beware, uh, more evidence may may appear. What about impregnated endotracheal tubes? Yeah, we had reviewed the silver-coated endotracheal tubes that Marin Koloff had studied a couple of years back, and they were costly, and the signal for efficacy was pretty poor, and so we did not adopt those. And you mentioned you use the subglottic suction endotracheal tubes. Is that for everybody? No, only in our patients who we believe um, are going to be on mechanical ventilation for more than 72 hours. Okay. Where, where did you buy your crystal ball? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, not, it's probably not a very good crystal <laughs> ball, but we try as much as possible. So, you know, somebody who has severe hypoxemia is probably going to be intubated for a period of time. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lena. I just had to ask that question because maybe you bought it someplace and I need to go there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. But yeah, so it, it is an important issue, though, John, because you're right. Like in the intensive care unit, that's our vast supply is our cast tubes, continuous acid for subglottic secretion, but you go down to the operating room and they have all standard tubes, you know. So <laughs> you're right. I don't know a good way to predict. Okay. All right. Well, let's move to ARDS, which is always a hot topic for any critical care discussion. So uh, are we changing the definitions again or trying to? God, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there is a push I think worldwide, to focus ARDS more on the severe form. Very good. Severe hypoxemia. <laughs> I think we all recognize that that moderate and mild ARDS for, I would say, the vast majority of patients is really not ARDS. It's by basilar atelectasis, pulmonary edema, pneumonia. <laughs> and it's not really ARDS. So there is a push uh, for future trials to really focus on inclusion of severe ARDS, which by the Berlin uh, definition is PF ratio, PaO2 to FiO2 ratio, less than or equal to 100, which I think is a good move. And in that group of severe ARDS, we still have a high mortality. Do you agree that the mortality really hasn't fallen much? Agree totally. And, um, you know, the, the recent trials um, are really important to look at, um, and, and I'll relate two of them. The EOLIA trial, which was an ECMO trial, day 60 mortality was, you know, 40 to 46%. And so that's a severe hypoxemia trial, right? PF ratio less than 100, and that was an ECMO trial. The other recent trial just published this year is the ROSE trial, which was neuromuscular blockade for ARDS. And in that trial, they actually enrolled um, both uh, severe and moderate ARDS, not quite the Berlin definition, PF ratios less than 150. So sort of severe ARDS and a little bit more towards the moderate side. And in the ROSE trial, the 90-day mortality was over 40%. So that's high. <laughs> <laughs> and not probably when you look at it statistically different than when we used to say 60% was our mortality for severe ARDS. Right. Well, we can keep trying, I guess. We can. So let's talk about some interventions then. There's been a lot of recent articles about the use of paralytics, and you mentioned the one trial with paralytics. So your take on this, because we've been told lately that paralytics are bad. Yeah, so I think um, 
We used to overuse neuromuscular blockers in ARDS. That's my personal take on the current evidence. And it was really based on the initial French multi-center trial. That trial was the Accuracis trial. But that trial was um, completed well over a decade ago. And in that study, they had reported that giving 48 hours of a cystiatricurium infusion uh, um, to these same moderate to severe ARDS patients, so PF ratio less than 150, had a marked reduction in mortality. So we all jumped on the bandwagon. <laughs> and I think to the credit of the new ARDS network, uh, which is now called the PEDAL Clinical Trials Network of the NIH, uh, one of their first trials was called the ROSE trial. Um, the ROSE stands for Reevaluation of Systemic Early Neuromuscular Blockade. And that was just published uh, this year in the New England Journal, uh, sort of middle of the year. And that showed no difference in 90-day mortality with, again, mortality rates that were over 40%. Um, so neuromuscular blockade had no benefit, no reduced mortality. But what's really important, I think, for all of us to review is that the control cohort in the ROSE trial uh, was a light sedation control cohort, whereas the French trial was a deep sedation cohort. So we've really changed our practice in the ICUs for our intubated patients to really um, have light sedation be the standard of care. So the ROSE trial was um, stopped early for futility, but it, it did enroll well over a 1,000 patients and I think the other important finding for all of us to really think about um, in the ROSE trial, because we see still a lot of patients come to us to our ARDS center on neuromuscular blockade, there was substantially higher serious adverse events in the patients on neuromuscular blockers. And it wasn't just ICU-acquired weakness. They did have ICU-acquired weakness, but they had serious cardiovascular events, other serious adverse events. And so it's not only that neuromuscular blockade is not beneficial, it's potentially harmful. And so I really tried to avoid neuromuscular blockade both to get a neurologic exam in these patients who have, you know, very severe hypoxemia. And I am a big proponent of moving towards spontaneous ventilation as soon as possible because that maintains both diaphragmatic and chest wall function, allows the patient to be awake and responsive, and we get them off the ventilator more quickly. Let me just ask you a question because where I find the paralytic still to be useful is that severely hypoxic patient, you intubate, you're trying to stabilize them on the ventilator as you're getting used to them and they're getting used to the ventilator, and, and they're just totally dyssynchrony between the ventilator and the patient. And I find a short course, 24, 48 hours of paralytics helps stabilize things, and then you stop them, and then, as you mentioned, you use light sedation and wake them up as much as possible. Is that fair? That is fair, John, I, but I would say I would aim more towards a 12-hour course. Ah, okay. And again, the rationale of we should be able to figure that out within that time frame. You are absolutely right. Ventilator dyssynchrony does the patient harm. And if you can't modify that with other drugs, you know, propofol, midazolam, fentanyl infusion, um, then I agree that is a, it's sort of a rescue strategy. And so it's fine to do it for a short term, but I would say minimize the duration as much as possible. Because again, even in the ROSE trial, the ROSE trial was just for 48 hours. Yeah. And those serious adverse events were seen with 48 hours of neuromuscular blockade. Okay. Fair, fair comment. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about another aspect of this. And you've already mentioned spontaneous breathing. So while not making it into CSAP 17, we had a lot of discussion about APRV. And there seems to be a little bit of emotion, a little bit of data, but there's certainly a lot of articles suggesting that APRV is the best mode for an ARDS patient. Comments? 
Yeah, I don't think uh, we yet have the level one evidence uh, to make that statement clearly, but many of us do use APRV as a strategy that allows us to provide high mean airway pressure, which is very good for alveolar recruitment, and yet allows the patient to spontaneously breathe and be comfortable. We don't yet have level one evidence, but the way I think about it is if that is the best strategy to minimize ventilator dyssynchrony that you just talked about and yet still provide quite high PEEP and mean airway pressure and the patient's comfortable and they're awake and spontaneously breathing, that's a great approach. Um, There is an emergence, I think, of identifying that keeping the lung open for a longer period of time without having high plateau pressures is beneficial, minimizes barotrauma. And again, APRV is another approach where your mean airway pressure is your plateau pressure almost, and so your plateau pressures are low. So it's protective. It allows spontaneous ventilation. There's minimal ventilator dyssynchrony. Patient can be awake. So there's a lot of great things about it. We all wish that there was level one evidence to support it, but not yet. Well, let me, let me ask you uh, another question when you use APRV, because it is really a reverse I to E form of ventilation, and we mentioned that we're going to limit fluids in our patients going forward because we think too much fluid is bad for the lungs and every organ as well. Do you get in the trouble ever with hypotension when you're trying to keep the patient as dry as possible and they're on APRV at a a very high level? Yeah, we sometimes do, and sometimes they require some pressors. Um, And I'm a fan of enteral midodrine, which is an enteral vasopressor, um, which actually blunts tachycardia, increases mean arterial pressure a little bit. And so for many of these patients that you are trying, you know, to get fluid off because you think a component of that hypoxemia is pulmonary edema, we will put them on midodrine, 10 milligrams, TID, um, and that provides adequate blood pressure support to tolerate that higher mean airway pressure with low intravascular volume status. Okay. Uh, Good idea. Now, we do have a question on prone positioning. How do you use that in your unit as a rescue approach to a patient with ARDS? Yeah, we believe that the evidence based on the Perceva trial um, really did identify that a significant number of ARDS patients are responder to prone positioning because, you know, if they've had a CT scan, you can see very clearly that they have posterior dependent atelectasis. So we are fans of prone positioning, um, and the way we use it as a rescue strategy is for our severe hypoxemia patients, we will trial prone positioning before we consider ECMO. And that is because a significant portion of patients will respond, um, and you can recruit the posterior dependent lung. So the way we've established it, somebody has severe hypoxemia, is not responding to standard mechanical ventilation strategies, higher PEEP strategy. We will then move towards prone positioning. What we do is we try to do it um, from 4 p.m. to 10 a.m. That then uh, allows them to be in a prone position all night um, so that if they respond, they don't get hypoxemic at night. But we do it early enough in the day that if they have a complication from it or they have a problem with it, we can turn them back pretty quickly. And it doesn't cross our nursing shifts, which is really also an important thing. And uh, uh, one of our nurses here um, has established an approach that's been here for a really long time of uh, really just using two people on each side to flip the patient. So we don't use any special bed Uh, We just uh, have two people on each side. We sort of shimmy the patient over to one side. We then put them prone. We put a little wedge underneath so they're not completely flat. And then for the head, we use um, two one-liter saline bags in a pillowcase so they sort of have a little water bed for their face. 
And it works great. And so we do it from 4 p.m. to 10 a.m. If they're a responder, we continue to do that and we assess the response. And then if we lose the response because they're getting better over time, then we just stop. Okay. And so we feel strongly it's a great, you know, rescue strategy that really doesn't have any cost. <laughs> just a couple of people. <laughs> And we assess their response. And then if they don't respond, then we move to other rescue strategies. Well, the rescue strategy that sounds like you moved to is ECMO, which is also a constant discussion when ARDS is raised. So are we getting better in applying it, or should we employ it not as a rescue method but earlier? Yeah, I think all of the studies um, in ECMO have really confirmed that the earlier you put a patient on ECMO, the better they do. The sort of additional reason to do it early is the technology has really changed. It really has become very easy to put somebody on ECMO. The circuits are much smaller. They're portable. We can move the patient's. We use a primary caregiver model, so it's a nurse model of care. So we don't have any ECMO tech or ECMO specialist at the bedside. We do have them, and they come when we cannulate, and they come if we're going to do a procedure. But otherwise, it's a standard ICU nurse taking care of the patient in the ICU. And Bob Bartlett, who's really the father of ECMO and developed uh, the ECMO uh, technique along with his research colleagues, has a great uh, statement that he commonly makes. Um, uh, he says, you know, you put them on ECMO and you kick them in the corner until their lungs get better. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like Dr. Bartlett. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure most of these people have adequate cardiac function, so you're using a veno-veno circuit, correct? That is correct. The vast majority of patients who have severe hypoxemia and severe ARDS respond very well to venovenous ECMO, and the mortality rates are low in the ELSA registry based on, again, an, an ability to use lower anticoagulation because you don't have an arterial access site that if it clotted would be a problem. <laughs> Um, the smaller circuits, the lower profile of the circuit, uh, we use a clear prime, not a blood prime, so much less blood transfusion. And um, we still have, um, if we're, you know, doing the ECMO cannulation emergently at the bedside, we have a two cannula approach. But if we have a little bit of time, uh, we'll put it uh, a dual lumen single cannula um, under fluoroscopy, which is better because then we can get them up and walk them around. And your access point for that single catheter is usually what? Is the right uh, internal jugular vein. Um, and uh, the cannula tip uh, goes down below the diaphragm and it has um, access ports so that you will withdraw blood from the inferior vena cava and then another couple of holes in the superior vena cava and that will be your venous outflow and your arterial inflow, meaning your oxygenated blood, goes into the second port of the cannula that goes directly into a side hole, uh, which is um, in the right atrium into the tricuspid valve. Okay. Let me ask you a politically correct or incorrect, depending upon your stance, question, and that is, is this a technique that should be among those that get aggregated at certain locations for the best results? Yeah, I think it is just like any other advanced therapy. You need a team that knows how to initiate, cannulate, manage the patient, and successfully get them off ECMO. And if you don't have a team that knows how to do that, it can be challenging. The Extracorporeal Life Support Organization, which is really the society that captures all data for much of ECMO that is um, done worldwide, published a statement a couple of years ago that really recommended that we should be looking at establishing centers of excellence for ECMO 
and that it would be best if patients with severe hypoxemia or cardiac ECMO, you know, whatever type of ECMO you're doing, be sent to centers of excellence for the best results. I think the analogy to think about is, would you want your liver transplant to be done in an institution that did one liver transplant a year or a hundred liver transplants a year? (laughs) And I think it's the exact same. You need a whole team and not every institution that sets up an ECMO center currently does that. Good analogy. And then my last question about ECMO for you, uh, you're going to have to dig your crystal ball out because I'm going to ask you, do you think ECMO is our answer to ARDS and we just don't know how to apply it yet to reduce the mortality that we see with severe ARDS? Yeah, that is a great question, John. And I I want to answer it in reviewing the results of of the recent EOLIA trial. You know, I mentioned earlier that that is our most recent ECMO trial in severe ARDS and that, you know, the trial still showed that there was a high mortality rate. Even with ECMO, there was a, you know, significant mortality rate. But not to look at the ECMO cohort, but to look at the standard of care cohort In that study, they allowed patients who who weren't doing well not on ECMO to cross over to the ECMO arm and get cannulated. And so if we look at that control cohort, that was about 125 patients, 28% of those control patients had to be crossed over to ECMO because they were dying. And so those patients that went on to ECMO late because they didn't respond to traditional management, many of them had cardiac arrest, heart failure. A number of them had to actually have VA ECMO. There were a number of them that arrested and basically had what we call eCPR, you know, ECMO during cardiac arrest. You don't want to get to the point in severe ARDS that you are that sick. (laughs) You should be thinking about ECMO as a strategy earlier if your other rescue strategies are not working. There is a period of time where potentially you can salvage them on ECMO, but if you wait too long, you won't. They will still die. And so, and, and that was our conclusion from the EOLIA trial. There's a lot of controversy about it, but basically the patients who were randomized to early ECMO really, in general, did better than the patients in the control cohort, even though, again, the study was stopped early for futility. It's a controversial study, but getting to your question, in my crystal ball, I think the cannulas are going to become even smaller. I mean, right now, that that dual lumen single cannula that I talked about is 31 French. It's big. And so, um, you know, the cannulas are going to get smaller. The machines are going to get smaller. And I think we'll use less anticoagulation. And overall, everything with ECMO will get safer. And there are strategies now that are um, being looked at with catheters that are the size of a hemodialysis catheter, you know, 12 French, 14 French, that can actually remove CO2 and put in oxygen. So... There's really good investigation ongoing. So uh, we will potentially move to the conundrum of how to select the patients to get the most benefit from this technology. Now, that is a very, very important point. Like, we should not be putting patients who we know from years of data collected by the extracorporeal life support organization who are going to die anyway, you know. Elderly patients don't do well, and patients who have a lot of chronic comorbidities don't do well. Patients who have some specific infections do poorly, whereas like somebody who has a viral pneumonia does great. So you are absolutely right. There need to be established um, really international guidelines regarding which patients um, would benefit. Well, let's talk about a a new topic for CSAP-17, really based upon new literature that has surfaced, and that is hypothermia for cardiac arrest. Many committees had vibrant discussions about the benefit, and so I'll ask, where do you stand on this topic? 
Yeah, we are uh, proponents of targeted temperature management. Uh, we actually uh, have a number of experts uh, locally here. Bob Newmar is our head of our emergency department and is a very established national expert in targeted temperature management. And so we have actually institutional guidelines that for a patient who's had a cardiac arrest, whether in or out of hospital, we manage them with TTM, targeted temperature management, and an urgent cardiac cath and PCI are our, you know, guidelines. I think at this point, um, we do have enough randomized large trials that confirm to what degree we should cool to and to what duration. And our current guidelines here at the University of Michigan take that evidence and basically say in writing in our critical care steering committee guidelines um, that we cool to 33 to 36 degrees, no benefit to going to 32. And then uh, we cool for 24 hours, no benefit to cooling for 48 Well, you certainly limit your complications when you cool to that temperature for that duration. We do, and I think, um, you know, the randomized trials to date have shown that cooling, you know, less less cool, (laughs) a little warmer, (laughs) and for shorter duration still achieves the potential neurologic benefits. I think one of um, the things we had been struggling about in the hypothermia realm was, was there any benefit in severe TBI? Because many of those patients get very febrile. But um, the recent uh, POLAR trial, which really um, enrolled patients with severe TBI and then cooled them to that same degree, 33 to 35, but, but did it for a longer period of time, at least 72 hours, showed no benefit in cooling for neurologic outcomes at six months. So, at least we feel better because we always had a question about that patient population. That's not cardiac arrest, but it's still a relevant patient population to us in uh, surgical critical care. We've been looking at that patient population and cooling for a long time and still haven't found the answer that cooling helps. That's for sure. Correct. Yeah. So um, our strategy now is to just try to prevent them from being febrile. (laughs) And your outcomes after cardiac arrest, you you are uh, convinced that you're seeing better outcomes? I think we're convinced that there's potential benefit. <laughs> this gets back to ECMO. The <laughs> question that is open in that patient population is, does eCPR, should that be part of the current algorithm of targeted temperature management, urgent cardiac cath, urgent PCI? because it provides uh, better cardiac perfusion support, organ support. So what we've seen is um, uh, with hypothermia for cardiac arrest, if the the patient does recover, we then have a neuroprognostication protocol that we go through after we wake them up. What we see that is problematic is they may not emerge neurologically, but if they do emerge neurologically, sometimes they have severe organ dysfunction or failure. So that's where the question of would ECMO for ECMO in cardiac arrest, eCPR, be beneficial as part of this protocol for the future? And we have a a study supported uh, by NIH that is ongoing here. Well, let's move on to another topic in the ICU, and that's VTE, venous thromboembolism. Uh, How do you provide prevention against VTE in the ICU? Uh, What drug do you use? Do you have a standard drug uh, so that everybody is getting mostly the same thing? Yeah, um, in our surgical ICU, uh, which has specialty patients, some trauma patients, um, we really use unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin both. We tend to use low molecular weight heparin for the cancer patients and unfractionated heparin for the rest. And I think in the general surgical ICU patient, the efficacy of both is really comparable We had this year the PREVENT trial that was published in the New England Journal, and it was a really interesting finding, and I I wrote a little letter to the editor about it because um, the vast majority of patients have received unfractionated heparin, and we tend to say that unfractionated heparin is not as good as low molecular weight heparin. 
But the VTE rates were very low at 3 to 4%, and they were doing twice-weekly duplex scanning. So they really, you know, identified uh, those VTEs very carefully. So in our surgical ICU, we use both, and we tend to use low molecular weight heparin for cancer. In trauma, in our trauma burn ICU, we use low molecular weight heparin for everybody. And there clearly is a good amount of evidence that in trauma, that it is superior to unfractionated heparin. Now, some of the data shows that some of our VTE cases are simply patients in that surgical ICU or that trauma ICU going back and forth to the OR and missing doses. Do you have a management plan so that doesn't happen? We do. Um, and that, I think, is vitally important <laughs> because um, just as you've brought up, if the patient goes uh, to the OR and you're holding that single daily dose of low molecular weight heparin because normally the dosing is 40 milligrams once a day, then they miss it for that whole day. And then if they're going back to the OR the next day for another procedure, then they miss it for two days. <laughs> So what we've done is in those patients transition to low molecular weight heparin, we use anoxaparin, 30 milligrams Q12, so that they at least receive one dose daily. And this, I think, is a really important issue because um, TQIP and um, even our Michigan, our statewide TQIP collaborative, has made um, VTE prophylaxis, pharmacologic prophylaxis, a performance improvement initiative for a number of years. And if you have a lot of those patients that are going back and forth for ortho and, you know, other things to the OR, you will not meet that performance improvement uh, benchmark. So you've you've got a workaround. We got a workaround, and um, actually, uh, I live here in the state of Michigan. And sometimes the workaround is really good because the vast majority of our patients are obese. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so they also warrant a bit of a higher low molecular weight heparin dose. So it actually works for them as well. Okay. Now let me ask you: Do, do you think the newer drugs are going to be better? especially when you look at their longer half-life, their ease of administration. Has your ICU steering committee thought about that? Yeah, we have not yet. Um, So (laughs) we have not yet done it for the ICU. Where we have done it is in trauma, in getting our trauma patients ready for discharge rather than sending them home on low molecular weight heparin or warfarin. We've actually been using uh, the DOAX for the 28 days of therapy that they need for the patients that have acetabular fractures, femur fractures, pelvic fractures. And that is much easier on our patient population. Uh, I think it's probably more effective, although I couldn't prove that, in part because compliance is better. I'll tell you, you you give me an oral drug to to prevent my VTE versus sticking myself every day. Uh, I'm going to have better compliance with my oral drug. Yeah, no question about it, right? And particularly, 28 days is a long time. Four weeks is a long time. <laughs> I, I, I will tell you, my my mother had that prescription, and I can tell you that I donated most of her low molecular weight heparin uh, after she was finished with her 28 day experience. <laughs> So now we have two new antidotes for DOAX, one for our uh, thrombin inhibitor and one for our factor 10. Have you got any experience with these new antidotes? Yeah, um, so um, I'd say the sort of older, newer one, idarucizumab, which is the reversal agent for dabigatran, we are using very rarely, but on a rare occasion we do use it, but we're seeing fewer patients on dabigatran. That's just the honest truth. So we we don't use that frequently at all. The most new one, um, Andexnet Alpha, is for reversal of rivaroxaban. And we have used it on occasion, but rarely, given its very, very high cost. And in our institution here, it is for hematology approval only, so we have to call hematology. But what I am concerned about, um, and right now I don't know where this will go, but prior to Andexna the Alpha being available, we had used um, prothrombin complex concentrate, PCC, 
for reversal of rivaroxaban. And there were studies that supported that it had reversed rivaroxaban, maybe 70, 80% of the drug was reversed. And it worked pretty well for us. And we haven't seen a head-to-head trial of andexanet alpha versus PCC. And so um, I personally would like to see that given the high cost of andexanet alpha. And, and I would say one other strategy that we're employing that I think is really being done nationally as well, not for the trauma patients who need urgent reversal, but let's say it's an emergency general surgery patient that needs an operation done, but you can wait 12 to 24 hours. Sometimes we ask when their last drug was that they took, and we just await dissipation of the drug based on half-life. So rivaroxaban half-life is like, you know, 9 to 14, 15 hours. We just wait and then delay their, their surgery. Lena, that means you have to take a history. Correct. And talk to the patient. (laughs) And talk to the patient. When did you last take your rivaroxaban? (laughs) The CT scan won't tell you that. (laughs) Correct. (laughs) Okay. And I think we have to be good stewards of this, just like we have to be good stewards of antibiotics. These are expensive, you know, agents in terms of reversal. And potential complications, thrombotic complications. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. Getting that history and finding out when they took their last dose sometimes will give you a, a wealth of information that, that can avoid you giving another drug uh, that not only is expensive, but potentially has its complications too. So Agree fully. So one last question about VTE. And, uh, and you kind of insinuated the bariatric patients uh, that you have in Michigan. And a lot of good studies about bariatric surgery has come out of Michigan. But uh, how about IVC filters? Is there still a place in the critically ill patient for their use? Or are they just an instrument of the devil, as some of my surgeons suggest? (laughs) I haven't heard that one, John. (laughs) So we still use IVC filters in a rare population, and they really fall into two patient categories. One is the patient who really requires systemic anticoagulation but can't receive it because of a bleeding complication, and that might be an intracranial bleed or a hemorrhagic complication in their surgery, but for some reason they can't receive systemic anticoagulation. So that's still a reason for us. It's rare, but but that is one. The second is getting back to my ECMO cohort. (laughs) If I've put a cannula in the femoral position and when I go to remove the cannula, um, we normally have our interventionalists come to the bedside and do intravascular ultrasound, IVIS. And if they see clot in the IVC, uh, we will put a filter in. They keep that filter. It's a retrievable one for three months. They stay on anticoagulation for three months. They come back. They get their filter out. We do a four-extremity duplex, make sure it's negative, and then stop their anticoagulation. What I am very clear about um, is that there is no efficacy of IVC filters in trauma patients who have a contraindication to pharmacologic anticoagulation. In those patients, we just wait a little while and get them on their pharmacologic low molecular weight heparin as soon as we can. But um, there was a really um, good multi-center trial in the New England Journal published this year by the New Zealand Critical Care Trials Group that showed no benefit. Let's take a topic called nutrition. And uh, we had very few questions about nutrition in the critically ill and CSAP-17 this go-round. Is this because... Enteral nutrition is accepted as the way to go, and everybody now believes TPN is as bad as people say it is? Yeah, I think um, the current evidence is that enteral nutrition is still the first-line therapy for nutritional management um, in the critically ill if their gut works, if you can use it, if they don't have fistulas, if they don't have a bowel obstruction. Um, So we all agree that that still is the best route. But TPN is not as bad as people say it is. And um, there are now a wealth of studies, and these are very well done international trials with very large sample size. And all of them from, you know, different parts of the world, different kinds of patients have really shown no difference in ICU outcomes uh, between patients getting enteral nutrition versus parenteral nutrition. 
And so I think the differences are that now we are using parenteral nutrition with glycemic control. We have better fats, better lipids. We are careful not to implement parenteral nutrition, for instance, in the first week of critical care when most of these patients are getting resuscitated. They really can't use these additional, you know, IV calories, glucose and and uh, proteins. And so I think we're just in, it, it's sort of, you know, critical care is, it has changed over the last decade. It's just like pretty much similar to the neuromuscular blockade issue, you know, we're now using light sedation instead of deep sedation. We're sort of reserving nutrition, um, not for the first, you know, five to seven days if somebody isn't horribly malnourished. So because there's no benefit to nutrition in that patient population. So TPN is not as bad as, as people say it is. And all of the recent parenteral nutrition trials have shown no increase in adverse events. The biggest adverse event that was quoted from older trials was much higher risk of infections in the ICU, and that has not been uh, recapitulated in the most recent trials. So what we do is, um, in our ICU patients, we first calculate a Nutrix score, and that tells us if that patient is nutritionally at risk meaning do they have signs and symptoms of malnutrition? Would they benefit from early nutritional therapy or not? And then once we define that, then we ask the question, okay, you know, if they're nutritionally at risk, the Nutrix score is high, then we need to start nutrition a little earlier because they will benefit from it. And then we say, okay, enteral versus parenteral, enteral whenever we can. And if we can't use enteral, then we go to parenteral. Let me ask, in your glucose level, what have you decided is the right level? Less than 180. Okay. And when you're on TPN, do you trickle feed the patient as well? Yeah, we try to. Um, we do believe that enteral nutritional support is important for the immunocytes and lymphocytes in the gastrointestinal tract since they are very plentiful there. <laughs> and so... Um, we try to. You know, we'll trickle it 5 or 10 cc's if we can. Yeah, we try. Okay. And then what about the metabolic cart? How many do you have floating around the ICUs? <laughs> well, we still have one. <laughs> and uh, we use it whenever we're at a loss. <laughs> um, and that usually is, you know, a morbidly obese patient, to be, to be very honest, John. I mean, that's a very difficult patient population to try and figure out what their caloric and protein requirements should be. And in, in those patients, we try to use low calories and very high protein, 2 to 2.5 grams per kilo per day. So um, the metabolic card is useful there. And the other patient population where it's useful is in a patient that has severe ARDS and both hypoxemia and hypercapnia. And so trying to determine if our, you know, high carbohydrate load is causing hypercapnia, and that's helpful. So we are not doing it as frequently as I would say a decade ago, but we still utilize it. Speaking of TPN, central lines, central venous lines, they seem to have disappeared from our unit. Not sure they're a rarity, but certainly we see less of them. Is that happening in your unit? Uh, absolutely no question. We have picks. Picks abound. <laughs> and how do you feel about the picks versus central access? Yeah. Well, um, you know, we've looked at our evidence here, and then there's published evidence as well. Um, there's, you know, really no difference in the line infection rates, the collapsy rates, um, um, because you can get a line infection from a PIC as much as you can get it from a central line. Um, but we we do um, see that the PICs are more comfortable for the patient, and the reason is that Years ago, we made a decision that, um, you know, the place that we would put the central lines would be in the IJ for safety issues, and we would put them all in by ultrasound guidance for safety issues. So we do many less subclavian, and we do IJs, but IJ lines are uncomfortable for the patient. So as sort of a patient-reported outcome, patients are much more comfortable with PICC lines. And I can't tell you how many times the ICU patient has said, 
you know, we we say, well, we should get the pick line out because it's been in long and your white counts high and you have a fever and they don't want to part with it because <laughs> <laughs> they get their blood drawn, they get their meds, they get their labs done. <laughs> So, um, but I share um, a significant concern that our uh, residents are not learning how to put in central lines because of the high rate of PIC. I find that more of these are being placed by a consult to IR than being placed in our ICU. So actually for us here, we have a nursing uh, cohort that places all of the PIC lines. Okay. And they are here 24-7. And um, the only lines that get placed in IR are what we call a proline. So if somebody has renal failure and therefore can't get a PIC because of concern about subclavian stenosis, then they go to interventional radiology and they'll get a tunneled line. But you are right. Um, the only PIC line that I can place is in my ECMO patient. <laughs> Because the nurses won't come and touch that patient. So if I need like another line in an ECMO patient, I don't want to put a large bore line and they'll bring me a PIC kit and I've put it in in our ECMO patients. One of the problems we've seen with our PICs that those patients don't want to give up is that we end up getting a thrombophlebitis. Is that a problem for you or not? Absolutely. Um, I would say the vast majority have some degree of venous thrombosis adjacent to the PIC line. We are mostly putting in dual lumen PIC lines, and they all get an adjacent uh, thrombosis. But most of them, you know, again, we use pharmacologic prophylaxis. Um, we haven't seen large central clots. These are small ones just directly adjacent um, in their arm. So I don't know what to do about that, honestly. Yes, sometimes they complain about that more than they complain about anything else that's going on with them. So Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, this is terrible uh, because I hate to say it, but it looks like our time is up this morning. And Lena, as usual, it's always a pleasure speaking with you about these topics. And I sincerely thank you for your contributions to CSEP 17 and now CSEP Audio Companion again. So as always, the author gets a chance to make any comments about CSAP or CSAP Audio Companion before we sign off. So the floor is yours to talk to the audience. Well, thank you, John. It's been a pleasure to talk with you this morning as well. And I would just like to say that, um, as, as you mentioned at the beginning, a longtime contributing author and uh, group leader in CSAP, I think our CSAP 17 product is absolutely amazing. Um, the additional features that it has, um, the wonderful education that it provides, the really cutting-edge, evidence-based questions, um, it just really is, is a work of art. And I congratulate you and your leadership for bringing it forward. And uh, we all really have had uh, a great time participating in it. And I think this um, CSAP Audio Companion is the second piece of where, you know, if individuals really desire to um, hear discussion and controversy and the issues that are facing us, particularly in the critical care environment, it's, it's riddled with controversy. I think it's, it's also just a great product. So uh, thank you again for your leadership. It's been great fun. Well, leadership may have helped, but without all the authors, we would not have a product. So uh, I thank you wholeheartedly for your contributions and uh, thank you for this morning and I hope you have a great day. Same here. That's the end of this session for this category of the CSAP 17 Audio Companion. This category will continue in the next session. <laughs>